Okay, I believe we are live. So hello everybody uh, who is watching out there in Apotec land on the interwebs. <laughs> uh, today we are uh, joined by one of our close colleagues and contributors actually on Apotec, uh, Dr. Luis Perez. He is a uh, big, big proponent, advocate, uh, and everyday user of all things having to do with accessibility especially around Apple's mobile devices, uh, a true expert in the field. So we are privileged to have you on today and uh, share us with uh, some lovely techniques. As I said, I always love sitting down with this guy because I always learn something new and cool that can benefit everybody. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the expert who will uh, dazzle and impress us and let us know what uh, he is up to and where he's heading next. So without further ado, uh, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, uh, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to share with uh, the Apotec crowd. Uh, always a pleasure, and I've really enjoyed working with all of you over the years. So what I'm going to do here is just share my screen real quick so that I can bring up my presentation. Everything okay on that end, Mike? You can see my slides? Yep, we're good to go. All right, so welcome everybody to today's presentation, uh, Enabling All Students with the iPad. As Mike said, my name is Luis Perez. Uh, I've been an Apple Distinguished Educator since 2009, and I currently work as an independent consultant focusing on accessibility and all things universal design for learning and universal design. Now, I'm going to try to leave some time at the end for some questions, but just in case um, I don't get to your question, uh, you can always reach me, or if you're watching this uh, later on, you could always contact me at uh, lfperez at me.com. And you can also follow me on Twitter at underscore Luis F. Perez. Um, there's a lot of Luis Perez's in Latin America, so um, that's like John Smith, so I had to make sure to include that underscore there. So don't forget that if you're trying to find me on Twitter. I also have a website uh, where I post a lot of resources that I create for educators and that's LuisPerezOnline.com. And of course, you can go to my page on Apitec, uh for uh, accessibility resources. So there's a lot of content there that you can access for free. So I want to begin with a quick video um, to kind of share with you my vision for what accessibility means to me and, and what I see it contributing to our students' lives. So hopefully the sound will come through. So let's give that a shot. And we're not hearing any sound. Oh. All right. Well, what I will do is link that uh, through the, um, the site. Now, of course, uh, a little little side commentary. I, I'm assuming all these photographs that we're seeing, which are gorgeous, are pictures you have taken, correct, sir? They are. Sorry about that. I thought the sound would come through. But just to summarize, basically what the video is talking about is my vision for technology and how it empowers uh, people of all levels of different ability. Um, and so, as I said at the end, you don't need to see to have vision. And my vision is a world where people can use technologies, um, creative ways to empower themselves and to live full and fulfilling lives. And for me, the expression of that is through my photography. Um, I try to use mobile devices every chance I get to take photos, and so you could see a few of them in that video. Uh, since you couldn't hear the sound, what I'll do is, um, I think, Mike, there's going to be a webcast uh, page, right? There will be, yes. So we can share the link to the video. It's also on my YouTube channel, which I'll mention later on in the presentation. So no worries. Um, there's another chance to uh, see it there. Excellent. 
So as Mike said, I'm, I'm a big advocate for universal design for learning. Um, that's the way that I see um, my vision kind of coming to life. Um, and universal design for learning, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's uh, really designing learning environments that work for everybody right from the start. Uh, and, and that means uh, making sure that the goals of your instruction, your methods, your materials, and your assessments all have been designed with accessibility and inclusive design in mind. Now, the great news is um, there is a new version of um, basically the book or, uh, on universal design for learning. Uh, and it's called Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice. And I've included the link here. Um, it's udltheorypractice.cast.org. Um, this book um, basically sets out um, where universal design for learning is right now in terms of theory and practice. So it's, it's nice in that way. It gives you the theoretical background, but also how it's being applied in classrooms around the country. And, and so um, I encourage you to check out that, that website. Um, Ann Mayer and David Rose um, were the ones who started Universal Design for Learning um, way back in the 90s. And so now they've created this free book. Um, you just need to sign up with an account at CAST. And the nice thing is that the book itself um, models a lot of the Universal Design for Learning uh, practices. So when you access the book online, you can watch uh, embedded videos. You can highlight, uh, you can take notes, and all those kinds of things. So here's a key concept of universal design for learning and how it has evolved. Um, the idea that in any classroom, even if you don't have any students who have been labeled as having disabilities, there's going to be a great deal of variability uh, in your learners. We call that systematic and predictable learner variability. So it, there, there will be a range of abilities, a range of strengths, a range of weaknesses. And it doesn't matter that students haven't been labeled. Um, and so that's the goal of this new updated version of um, UDL. It's to really move us beyond the labels. And, and who has an IEP, who does not have an IEP, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, everybody in the room is going to be along a continuum in terms of what their abilities are. Now, when we look at that learner variability, there are some patterns that emerge. So again, that's uh, even though we have a great deal of variability, there is some predictability as well. And uh, learners vary along three different dimensions, uh, which I'm going to talk about very briefly. Um, if you want to get more information, um, here's the website to go to. It's cast.org. Uh, again, they're the ones who kind of maintain universal design for learning and do a lot of the research behind it. So basically what um, researchers have identified when they look at the brain is three different networks. Uh, an effective network, a recognition network, and a strategic network. Um, if you've seen UDL before, you'll notice a small change here. Uh, the effective network used to be the third item on the list. Uh, well, now it's being moved up to the front. And that's just recognizing how important motivation is uh, for learning. Uh, if a learner is motivated, even if you have barriers in the other areas, in the recognition and strategic areas, they will work to overcome those barriers. So that's why it's so important. So very briefly, the effective network is the why of learning. It's what motivates you to learn. It's also the way that you interact with the environment around you and your self-regulation. So how are you able to control your emotions and your attention so that uh, it doesn't interfere with a learning task as well. The recognition network is the what of learning. And this is basically the way you learn factual information. Um, it processes the information you receive through your senses. So what you see, what you hear, what you touch, and so on. And then it uses pattern recognition to recognize um, meaningful patterns in that information that's coming into your uh, nervous system. The strategic network is how you plan and execute tasks. So when you ask a student to solve a math problem or when you ask them to write an essay for homework or on a test, their strategic network is engaged. And so this is how you plan, how you execute, and also how you monitor to make sure you're doing the right thing and uh, adjust on the fly and, and pick from a set of strategies to be able to do that task successfully. So each of these networks has a corresponding principle that you can use to design instruction that supports learners along that dimension. So for the effective network, 
that uh, means providing multiple and flexible means of engagement. Um, that basically is providing students a voice and choice, um, highlighting how the information is relevant to them, highlighting why it's important to learn it, and then providing some choices so that you're developing their autonomy and so that they become independent uh, learners who are motivated and um, resourceful. For the recognition network, this means providing multiple and flexible means of presentation. So ensuring that the format of the information does not become a barrier to learning. Uh, providing the information in a variety of formats uh, like audio, text, images, and at the same time, even for those students who don't need a special format, uh, just providing a range of examples so that learners can see the connections in the information uh, is important here. And then also supporting their language needs. So for a student who needs the content translated so that they can access it, that, that's also a, a helpful uh, strategy is to provide translation tools or to clarify vocabulary. Um, that you need to have or background knowledge that you need to have in order to get the most of what you're reading or the other content. For the strategic network is providing multiple and flexible means of action and expression. And what that means is essentially providing a variety of ways for how learners can show what they know and what they've learned. And at the same time, they're developing their what's called executive functioning, um, their ability to plan and to develop um, strategies for learning. So that's a real brief overview. Uh, again, you can go to cast.org and, and get a lot more on universal design for learning. So where do mobile devices fit into this, which is really the main topic today? Well, for the um, effective network, we know that these devices are very personal. Uh, students can customize them in a variety of different ways, you know, from changing the home screen all the way to the apps that are installed on them. Uh, another big factor to consider is that um, mobile devices don't have the stigma that traditional assistive technology does. And so they can, um, they're more readily accepted by students with disabilities and uh, they're also more readily accepted by their peers. So all of a sudden you don't have a bulky or uh, device that kind of makes you stand out. And so that's an important consideration as well. Um, Mobile devices also include a number of features now that allow you to access the content or the representation of the information. And that ranges from closed captions to text-to-speech to a screen reader, which we'll look at in just a few minutes. And again, when it comes to action and expression, uh, the learners have a variety of ways that they can interact with the devices and show what they know. So for those students who have difficulty with typing, they can use dictation. For those who can't use a touch screen, they can use switch access, which is now built in. And then there's also Siri. So there's a lot you can do with uh, Siri to interact with your device. So all of these features are built in um, are an example of universal design. And universal design, if I had to summarize it in one short phrase, is built in, not added on. So from the start, as part of the design, you include accessibility and in an inclusive design so that um, it, it's a part of the design right from the start. Uh, here's the great example of that is uh, curb cuts. So these uh, features in the environment were designed for people with disabilities, right? Uh, people who use a wheelchair, for example. But it turns out that everyone can benefit from them. So uh, people who are delivering something to a building, um, computer repair people who have a cart with a lot of computers on them, um, people on a bike makes it much easier to access a building uh, and even parents who are pushing a stroller uh, with young children in it uh, they find this feature of the environment uh, useful so again that's the concept of universal design is you design for one group uh, what we consider those who are on the edges but the design benefits everybody in between so that same philosophy is behind the accessibility features on mobile devices such as the iPad, the iPhone, and the iPod Touch. Um, so what I wanted to do now is switch over to my iPad, if everything cooperates, and kind of give you a quick demo of some of these features. So let me bring up my iPad here, and we'll see if we can make that work. So far so good, Mike? All right. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yes, we are looking good. All so, right. 
Great. All right, so hopefully you'll be able to hear my uh, audio, but if not, I will kind of walk you through. So where do you find all these accessibility features, these built-in supports? Well, you go into your settings. Over on the left side, you're going to choose general. And then over on the right side, so I'm scrolling just so that you can see, um, you will select accessibility. And you'll see there's quite a range of different features here, and they're organized in different categories, like vision, hearing, uh, learning, physical and motor. And then we have an accessibility shortcut at the bottom. The accessibility shortcut allows you to turn some of these features on and off uh, on the fly. So if you're reading an ebook and all of a sudden you decide you need voiceover uh, to read it back to you, you can turn it on just by triple clicking your home button. Uh, so here I have it set to switch control because I'm going to work with that feature later on. And I highly recommend as you're exploring some of these accessibility features, make sure you use the accessibility shortcut. Uh, some of these features were designed specifically for people with disabilities and they know how to use them really well. But as you're learning, there are spots where maybe you get stuck just because you're not used to interacting with a device in a special way. So I recommend um, you have a set, um, you know, in the accessibility shortcut, whatever feature you're trying out, make sure you have that set there. So let me just feature a couple of items here since we have limited time today. A very powerful universal design for learning support here is closed captioning. So this is found on their hearing in the accessibility options. You can turn it on here using the switch at the top. And then any video that has captions on them, you'll be able to see them. So that could be a podcast. It could be a video you've purchased through iTunes and so on. But here's what's really cool in iOS 7. You can actually customize the appearance of captions. So if we select classic here, oh, I lost my place here. Give me one second. If we select the classic option, those are the captions you're used to, right? When you turn on your TV and you mute it. And they're not that easy to read. They're kind of blocky. We can also choose a default setting. So that's making them even better because now the text is more legible. Or we can go all the way up to large text. So if you have a student who has uh, a visual uh, difficulty, you can turn this on and now the captions are larger. What I really like here is you can customize them. So if you have a student who needs yellow text on a blue background, that's not a problem. You can just tap on create new style and here there are all kinds of options for how you can customize the appearance of the captions. Everything from the text to the background, uh, even adding uh, shadow to the text to make it easier to um, pick out when you see it. And so you can see a preview right there. So the reason why I started with uh, captions is we think of these um, captions as being an option just for students with hearing difficulties. But if you have um, struggling readers in your classroom, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that turning on the captions can be helpful to them as well. Um, also, if you have English language learners, again, having that multi-sensory learning where they hear it and they also get to see it can be helpful. And then finally, just if you're learning a new topic and you're not familiar with the vocabulary, it can be helpful to turn on the caption so you can see exactly what they're talking about in text. So again, a great universal design for learning support because it's it designed for one group, but it benefits a whole uh, range of others. You can customize the text appearance here so you can make it a large type, uh, bold, and so on. And then um, I want to highlight speak selection because this is a great feature that, again, can benefit a lot of people. Uh, speak selection, you can come in here, um, turn it on, and then you have a number of different voices you can select from. And as you can see, there's different, many different languages that are supported. For some of the voices, you can even select different accents. So as you can see, I like Australian English. I kind of find it nice and pleasing. So you can choose different voices. For each of the voices, you can choose a different speaking rate. And then very important that you can highlight words. So basically, with speak selection, you set it up in the settings. And then I'm going to bring up a note here. And then we'll see how that works. So what I'm going to do is choose the text just by tapping on it once, using the handles to make a selection. And then when I let go, I get a menu that says speak on it. 
And if I tap that, we're going to see the uh, text kind of be read out loud, and you're also going to see it be highlighted. Atlantic Goliath grouper may reach extremely large sizes, growing to lengths of up to 10 feet and can weigh as much as 790 pounds. Hopefully you could hear that, and you could hear the nice, pleasing Australian accent. <laughs> so speak selection is it's a great feature because um, it was designed, if you go into the accessibility settings, you'll see it's found on their vision. But it turns out that most of the students who use this feature are those who have learning difficulties, such as dyslexia. So another example of you design for one group, and then it benefits others. I'm going to skip, skip over voiceover um, because, you know, that's something you can play around with in your own time. But I, I want to highlight one last feature here, which is uh, switch control. So this is a feature that was just introduced in iOS 7. And for those of you who are not familiar with switch access, um, for students who have motor difficulties or sometimes cognitive difficulties as well that prevent them from using um, a touch screen, you can use uh, something called a switch. And what I'm going to do here is bring up the camera so that I can show you what a switch interface looks like. So this is a device that connects over Bluetooth. Hopefully you can see that. And it's basically two buttons. So with these two buttons, you can press on one of these buttons, the orange one in this case, to move a cursor around on the screen. Then when the cursor gets to the item I want to select, I can press the other button, the white one, or at least the way that I have it set up. There's a number of different ways you can configure this. This one comes with two buttons already included, as well as the switch interface, and then you can pl plug in two other buttons. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. So with switch control, what we do is first go into the settings, go into general and accessibility, but before I do that, I want to make sure on the Bluetooth my device is paired. So you can see it there. It's called a Blue 2 from a company called AbleNet. And it's, it's my favorite blue uh, uh, switch interface just because it's so small, so light, and I also like the way it looks. Uh, it doesn't look like traditional assistive technology. So once I have enabled it in the Bluetooth settings, I can come in here. I can turn on switch control. And you can see there's now a blue cursor around. Every time I tap the button on the right side here, which is the orange button, I can move that cursor. When I get to the item I want to select, I can press the other button on the left, which is the white button, and that's like tapping on the screen. So as long as you can move one finger and you can tap on these buttons, you have quite a bit of control over the iOS interface. Now, uh, in addition to using an external switch, I can also use the screen. Um, so basically, I can let, I can set the device to auto scan for me. So you can see here, there's a setting called auto scan. And then, if I don't have a switch interface, I can just let the cursor move around the screen. And when it gets to the item I want to select, I can just tap on the screen. And that's the same uh, thing as pressing on an external switch button. And then you can also use the camera as a switch source. So you can just uh, look to the left or look to the right, and that's the same as pressing a switch. So um, lots of options there. Um, again, you can see you can change the visual appearance of the cursor and so on. Uh, what's really powerful about this is you also have access to gestures. So I'm going to enable it real quick. i move the cursor around a few times, and then I'm going to double tap uh, on the white button, the one that I normally use to select. And you can see now I can do scrolling. I can um, basically press home, the equivalent of pressing the home button on my device to go to the home screen. So let's do that. And that just went to the home screen. And now I can move around. And when I get to the row that I want to select, I'll press my other button. And now I can also navigate through the different apps. And you know what? Let's take a photo. How about we do that? So I've moved the cursor until I've selected the photo option. Press my other switch, and we've already taken a photo just using a switch interface. How cool is that? <laughs> so I uh, have it set up 
so that I can turn off switch access just by triple clicking the home button. So again, as I mentioned, that's a really nifty shortcut. I triple click home and switch control is now deactivated. Um, here's a quick trick uh, since we're on the, you know, the demoing some of the accessibility features and a lot of people don't know about this. Uh, some of the accessibility options you can turn on and off using Siri. So if I press and hold the home button, turn on voiceover. Okay, I turned on voiceover. Pretty cool, right? Then I just press the home button and now voiceover is activated for me. So I can now move around the screen. Double tap to open. It'll take a second on the screen. It's not uh, refreshing. But that allows me to use uh, Siri to turn on settings like voiceover, uh, like uh, invert colors, which gives you a higher contrast display. And then when you're done, you can turn it off again just by using Siri. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to my presentation. And we'll talk about apps. So that's just a quick demo. There's a lot more to it. I'm going to share a resource with you at the end of where you can get more information about these accessibility options. So let's talk about apps. Um, this is a resource I want to share with you. This is a framework that I've developed to help me think about app selection. Uh, it all become, starts with uh, needs assessment and resource mapping. So really thinking about what do you already have in your environment that you could be using to, to make it more inclusive and to provide supports for students. And then where are the barriers? Where are those points where students are not uh, being able to access uh, resources and information? And a lot of those barriers we can overcome even before we think about apps we can overcome those barriers by using the built-in features. So that's really the next level of um, this model here. It's providing that access to content and tools using built-in accessibility options, which costs you nothing other than the cost of the device. Uh, so this model is based on Samir. Um, I'm sure those of you who are on Apotec uh, frequently know about the Samir model of technology integration. And it stands for substitution, amplification, modification, and redefinition. So the idea is to move from substitution to redefinition. Uh, it's a series of steps or a ladder. Uh, so I've incorporated this into this model, but I've also included universal design for learning. Uh, so when we think about it from a universal design perspective, um, the goal at the enhancement um, stage really is to provide representation, to provide access to the information and the content. And here, the, the voice that we hear in the classroom, for the most part, is the teacher. But what we want to go is to action and expression, where the voice is primarily that of the student that we hear in the classroom. Uh, because the goal of universal design for learning really is to develop those lifelong learners who are independent, who are um, self-guided, self-motivated. And so the best way to do that is by uh, giving the options that allow them to take ownership of their learning. And so that's when we're going to get the most engagement. And that's why I've put that at the top. So in, in the Samir model, there's this talk of um, teaching above the line, which is basically moving into those stages of modification and redefinition where we look at some creative ways of using the technology that we haven't thought of before. And so for me, as a person with a disability myself, this has all to do with expression and creativity. And how do we allow students to kind of express themselves and gain their, their own personal voice um, and express what they, what they know, but also what they feel and their dreams or their thoughts and so on. And so technology can play a big role in that, especially digital media and when combined with the new accessibility features. So what I want to do again, I'm going to switch back to my iPad and just show you um, three apps uh, for today. And these three apps um, kind of allow us to walk that ladder a little bit. So let me enter full screen here. I may have to... Voice up. Let me disable voiceover real quick and then bring up my computer or my iPad again. There we go. So just three apps. Again, we, we already cover the first level of the model by looking at the accessibility features. And, and that's the very basic at the bottom. We have to provide um, a minimum level of access. But here are three apps that I've used 
um, that I find really helpful. So when we look at the next level, which is um, still within enhancement, uh, but the modification, there's an app called Voice Dream. It's a $10 app, and if you have any students with learning difficulties, um, this is a great app. Uh, you can try it out. There's a light version. So the first thing you'll notice here is it has a special font. So if I go into my uh, text options or text settings, the name of this font is Open Dyslexic. So this is a font that's been found to help students with dyslexia and other reading difficulties. You can adjust the text size. You can enable word highlighting. You can even change the color of the background and the text, and even create your own custom uh, themes, something you, you can't do with a built-in accessibility option. Another nice feature here, I'm going to set, set that back to the light color. It's much easier to see on the screen. You can pinch in. And we now have a focus reading mode. So it kind of gets rid of those distractions. And then if I double tap a word, it will start reading from that point. I can pinch out, and it brings back the entire page of text. Uh, so you can see it highlights not only the word, just like uh, Speak Selection does, but also the current line that you're on. And you have a range of different navigation options at the bottom, and even a sleep timer. So you can set up how long you want to read. You can uh, add bookmarks, highlights. So this is a great app. Um, I think it's well spent $10 if you buy this app. But again, there's a free version, Voice Dream Lite, which you can try out. You can import EPUB, PDF. Um, you can connect. Um, even websites you can open in here. So a great option for providing that additional support in text. Uh, the next app I'm going to bring up is Book Creator for iPad. And you're probably familiar with this one because it's so popular. But I want to show you how I use it from a UDL perspective. So what I'm going to do here is build a, just create a new book. And we're going to stick to the portrait orientation. And so, as we know, in, in um, Book Creator, you can bring in photos. Just tap the plus in the upper right-hand corner. Go into your camera roll. Bring in a photo. You can drag it around on the page. You can resize it using the handles and so on. You can then add text. And I have some text already here. Um, you can select any item on this text and make it into a hyperlink. So again, if you need to provide background knowledge, maybe that's a student who doesn't know about Florida or doesn't know, um, you know, uh, where Fernandina Beach is, you can link to a map and so on. So again, you're providing that additional background knowledge that the student needs. Once you've added a text, you can place it on the page, change its size, and so on. And then we can add that same text as audio. So again, providing that multi-sensory experience. So I'm going to come in here and add sound. Atlantic Goliath grouper may reach extremely large sizes, growing to lengths of up to 10 feet and can weigh as much as 790 pounds. I'll go ahead and save that. And now we have that same text in audio format. So a student who needs to have it uh, read out loud, and maybe they don't want to use the built-in text-to-speech because it's not as um, natural sounding. Well, they can just have the teacher um, read it to them here just by tapping this option. You can draw as well. So we can use the pen here, and we can create a drawing. So we can use that to highlight information in our photos and so on. So there's lots of options here for uh, engaging students in a variety of ways. And the true power of this app, and it's again, it's not when the teacher is creating the content, but when we turn it over to the students and they show us what they know in a creative way. When you're finished, you can share this with um, uh, in iBooks. You can open it in the iBooks app, and then you can use all the standard accessibility features there. Or even send that over to uh, Voice Dream Reader. So um, this, it's really nice that you have those sharing options in there. And then finally, uh, one of my favorite apps is called Pictello. So Book Creator is $4.99, I believe. 
but you can also again try it out for free. There is an option where you can um, you can purchase um, or you can download a free version of it, create one book, and then if you find that you like it, you can get additional books uh, with an in-app purchase. So I'm going to show you. Pictello is really a um, storytelling app. It allows students who use VoiceOver, who use Switch Access, to come in here and create their own custom stories. So here we're using the camera, we're using text-to-speech, uh, and so on. So let me just bring up one as an example. Uh, this is one that comes with the app already. It's called uh, Italian Vacation. So again, you can uh, add either images or video on each page. The text labels that you add, I, I, um, either at the top or at the bottom, they can include a word highlighting. So, and it's really easy to use. You just tap on the screen. It will read the text out loud. You can then navigate to the next page. Here is one where there's actually a recording. So on, you can combine text-to-speech as well as audio recordings. So again, we're including that multi-sensory experience where we have text, we have images, we have audio recordings, and text-to-speech. The nice thing about this app, too, is you can share these stories. So there is a, a sharing server where students can share the stories. So, uh, for instance, they can share with parents, they can share with peers. So it really uh, helps to build in that collaboration. Uh, so it's one of my favorite apps because, again, we're kind of working at that higher level in the Samir model where we're giving students a voice. Uh, we're turning it over to them to show us what they know in creative ways. All right, so let me come back here to my presentation, and we'll wrap this up. with some resources. Um, I'm not going to play the video because I, I know that there were some issues with the audio, but I want to share a few resources with you. I recently did a course. Um, I'm part of the Special Education Technology Special Interest Group. Wow, that's a uh, mouthful. Uh, mm -hmm. Of ISTE, uh, SEDSIG, so for short. So if you go to sedsig.com, we actually created a course on universal design for learning. Uh, so this was a four-week course. Um, this is the last week, unfortunately. But all of the resources that we've created, including all the webinars and all the uh, course products that students have created, they're going to be available at this website. So you can go there and, and just get some really great information. Uh, we even have somebody from CAST as one of the webinar presenters. So um, if you want to know more about UDL, more about using apps to support UDL, this will be the, the place to be. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, I do have a YouTube channel, and uh, my username is LFPerez72. Uh, I think that we'll link to this in the webcast uh, page as well. So um, if you want to learn more about VoiceOver or Switch Access, this is a great place where you can see some tutorials. Uh, of course, I practice what I preach, so all the tutorials are closed captioned. So you can turn down the sound even if you're in the classroom and just follow along with the text. And then finally, um, I do have a book that's available for sale. It's called Mobile Learning for All, Supporting Accessibility with the iPad. And the focus is, as you guessed it, probably UDL and how do we support the UDL principles using uh, not only the built-in accessibility features, but a whole range of apps. Um, I think I have more than 150 apps that are mentioned in the book. Um, if you're watching this, you can also scan that QR code, and it will take you to the page for the book. Uh, so that's that's all I have for you today. So I encourage you to uh, learn more about UDL and the new changes to it. Um, I think it's really bringing UDL in line with um, you know developments in technology and the opportunity that technology really gives us to provide a more flexible learning environment that works for everybody. And uh, feel free to drop me a line or follow me on Twitter, and I would love to connect with you and continue the conversation there. All right. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Luis, uh, always, always fantastic. Uh, if you want to, want to kick out of your. Uh, yep, absolutely. I'll come back. Come back. Okay. Always well, love, always love sitting down with you. Like I said, I, I uh, learn more in this uh, webcast uh, on accessibility. Every time we, uh, you know, every time we. Um, <clears throat>
have a chance to hear from you. I know a lot of times, um, you know, I'm lucky that uh, while you're getting yourself squared away there, I know a lot of times. Uh, there we go. We're lucky. There you are. A lot of times <laughs> we're lucky with our um, uh, AD group where we're able to uh, have you and a bunch of your other uh, colleagues who are very big on accessibility always reminding us of a lot of these concepts of, of UDL and everything else. And a lot of it, you know, is great practice. As I opened in the beginning, these are things that help anyone. I know I've, I've implemented a lot of these techniques in, in my own presentations and my classroom and working with colleagues and thinking about designing instruction. Um, and you know, it, it's it's uh, beautiful to just uh, know that they're right there for you. Like you said, I, I think uh, you said it best, you know, built in, not added on, right? And trying to do things um, uh, you know, maybe targeted to one group, but they benefit everybody, you know, and there, there are some great guiding principles. Um, you know, I know you're going to be coming uh, to what, later this week, you're going to the ICE conference in Illinois to talk about some of these things. And that, That's right. I'll be, I'll be doing a number of sessions there, and uh, I'll be doing one on the same topic, on apps and, and accessibility. I'll also be doing one on ebooks and how to design textbooks um, that work for everybody. Uh, so basically implementing the same concepts of universal design but using iBooks author as a platform because it has a lot of options in there that allow you to provide supports uh, for learners who need them. So um, uh, to be able to create textbooks that are flexible and that work for everybody it's a great, great opportunity that we have. And so I, I think um, when you think about this, um, we live in an excellent, like a great opportunity. Um, our classrooms are more diverse than ever, which mm -hmm. sometimes we think of that as a problem. It's not a problem. It's an opportunity. We have people coming to our classrooms with all kinds of talents, all kinds of experiences, and we can leverage that to create a really rich learning environment. And then at the same time, the technology has become more flexible and more robust. So we have the opportunity to leverage those two things to just create education that's, you know, off the charts, right? Um, but I'll also be doing a session on photography, <laughs> <laughs> which is really cool. I think it'll be the only EdTech conference this year where there will be a blind person teaching people about photography. <laughs> so if That's... you're at ICE, you should come and see it. It should be pretty interesting. I know. I wish I could get a, get, get a little ticket there to head over to Chicago. So I would definitely say if folks are in the area, definitely, hopefully they come by and uh, take a look. But as you mentioned, we'll, we have all of your, we have your dedicated section there. Uh, with tons of the resources that you've mentioned. What we'll do, though, uh, maybe is we can pull out some of the, uh, like a show notes we'll do here probably maybe next week, and we can put some highlights of things that are in this webcast. Um, so you have all your resources, and we'll, we'll point to some more things uh, right on your page for this specific webcast. So it was great having you on today. I actually thought of you just the other day. Uh, I was reading about... Uh, one of these new add-on devices that, uh, like a like a hearing aid that ties into the uh, iPhone. I'm sure you probably are aware of this. Yeah, uh, it just just came out. It's a great option. I, I want one for myself just so <laughs> I can listen to music. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But uh, always always exciting to have you on. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, everybody out there, if you're uh, catching this on YouTube or or after the fact, please. Uh, visit Louise's resources, and he's a great person to talk to and connect with. And like I said. I'm sure you learned a ton in this. I know I did. Always a pleasure. We will uh, we will be see you again, Luis. All right. Thank you very much, Thank Mike. Thanks Take a lot. Take care, right, everybody. everybody. All right. Bye bye.